Well, good morning again. A little feedback there, sorry. Great to see you. This morning I have the uh, privilege, responsibility of talking with us, with us about the parable of the sower that Jesus told, recorded in three of the Gospels, the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Of course, we're in the book of Luke, so we're going to read his account. So if you have your Bibles, I'd invite you to turn to Luke chapter 8. But uh, before we begin, let's have a word of prayer. Father, teach us what we need to know. Show us what we need to change. Make us more like Jesus, people we really want to be. Amen. We begin with the first three verses of this chapter, which is kind of an interesting uh, introduction to the parable that he's going to tell. Let me read those verses. After this, this is after Jesus had dealt with the uh, woman that Pastor Jordan preached about last week. After this, Jesus traveled about from one town and village to another proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him, and also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases, Mary, called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had come out, Joanna, the wife of Cusa, the manager of Herod's household, Susanna, and many others. These women were helping to support them out of their own means. Interesting way to start the chapter. So at first it says that Jesus is moving about from village to village, proclaiming the good news, the kingdom. And that's exactly what he, was, he had come to do before he would die the sacrificial death for us and pay the penalty. He was fulfilling the prophecies of Isaiah and others that he would preach the kingdom of God and he would go about doing that. And so that's what he's doing. He's fulfilling his calling. But along with the 12 disciples were these women. And he mentions three of them by name. Mary Magdalene, we're familiar with her name. Joanna, the wife of Cusa, and her husband happened to be the manager of Herod's household, which is interesting detail to know, that they were followers of Jesus. Uh, and one of them was married to the guy who was running Herod's household. And then Susanna who might be among the ones of whom, from whom demons were cast, and other women. I find that an interesting thing to add. And, and the question arises, why would he say that? Other than the fact that it was true, it's what was going on. Well, for one thing, I would say it emphasizes this. Women have always been essential to the work of the ministry. Were it not for godly women supporting and also doing a lot of work in ministries all over the world for the whole time of Christendom, the progress and the process of fulfilling the Great Commission would not have advanced as much as it has. Women continue to play, have a large role in the advance of God's, God's kingdom around the world. So many of our own missionaries are women. And you look in virtually every church that's functioning well, there are many women actively involved in doing the work of the ministry. I, along with our elders and probably many of you, I praise the Lord for the many good and godly women who serve here at Bethel, the work of this ministry. Thank you, ladies, for your important contributions to the work of the ministry. Now Jesus goes on to tell this parable. Let me read verses 4 through 15. While a large crowd was gathering and people were coming to Jesus from town after town, he told this parable. A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, was trampled on, and the birds of the air ate it up. Some fell on rock, and when it came up, the plants withered because they had no moisture. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up with it 
and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up and yielded a crop, a hundred times more than was sown. When he had said this, he called out, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. His disciples asked him what this parable meant. He said, The knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of God has been given to you, but to others I speak in parables, so that, though seeing, they may not see, though hearing, they may not understand. This is the meaning of the parable. The seed is the word of God. Those along the path are the ones who hear, and then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved. Those on the rock are the ones who receive the word with joy when they hear it, but they have no root. They believe for a while, but in the time of testing they fall away. The seed that fell among the thorns stand for those who hear, but as they go on their way, they're choked by life's worries, riches, and pleasures, and they do not mature. The seed on good soil stands for those with a noble and good heart who hear the word, retain it, and by persevering, produce a crop. Before we get into the explanation of this parable and discussion of it, I want to ask a favor of you all as we consider what we're going to talk about in this parable and the rest of the chapter up through verse 18. Here's the two things I want to ask of you. The question arises in my mind, why did Jesus tell this parable? What's his purpose? That's a reasonable question. Anytime you read God's word, it's, it's right to ask yourself, why is this here? Why did the Holy Spirit choose to include this in the scriptures? So as we think about this chapter, I want you to keep in the back of your mind, if you will, two things. Number one, what do you think was in Jesus' heart as he was telling this parable? In other words, what was his disposition? What was going on in his mind as he was sharing this passage? How did he feel about this? We're not told exactly, but think about that. Question number two, what should be in your heart as you listen to this parable? What kinds of things are you stirring about? What are you contemplating? What in your deepest understanding are you becoming aware of? Before we get into the verse-by-verse -verse explanation of the scripture, of the parable, we need to talk about a verse that is number eight, the end of verse eight. Jesus said something unusual. He's, first of all, he said, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Well, th th didn't they all have ears? Didn't they all hear? Well, you know how that is. You can hear and not understand. So Jesus is in effect saying quite clearly, this is important. Hear it, understand it. This is something important. Hopefully, as we consider it, we'll realize that. Now, I'm, I'm going to do something a little different now. Usually, you get the big idea of a sermon toward the end. I'm going to give it to you right now. I'm going to tell you the big idea here. And here it is. People who take God's word seriously, who understand it and obey it, produce a harvest. They're wise and they're fruitful. People who don't take God's word seriously not only fail to understand and bear fruit, but tragically, they don't believe and ultimately are not saved. That's what this parable teaches, among other things. Now let's talk about the parable itself. Jesus begins with him telling his disciples something else we need to understand. He said this, the knowledge of the kingdom of God has been given to you, but to others I speak in parables, so that seeing they may not see, though hearing they may not understand. That's a little bit difficult to comprehend at first notice. You're, you would ask yourself, 
Is Jesus saying, I don't want these people to understand. I'm keeping it from them so they can't understand, so they have no chance to understand. Is that what he's saying? We could read those words that way. Let me quote for you from the Moody Bible, Bible Commentary what it says about that verse. Jesus answered in effect, this should be on the screen, the Moody Bible Commentary. Jesus answered in effect that his parables made it possible for the fruitful hearted, talks about that in verse 8, the illuminated heart, talks about that in verse 16, to really hear and understand while making it impossible for the hard hearted, the distracted heart, and the careless heart to see, hear, or understand. Those who care and take the word seriously and are fruitful and illuminated will understand. Those who are hard-hearted, those who are distracted, those who are careless will not understand. So, as we walk our way through these verses, I'd encourage you to be among the former, not the latter. Be those who are fruitful hearted, who want to bear fruit, who want to have the light, who want to do, hear and understand and do what God's word says. So now Jesus gets into the explanation of the parable itself. And he says this to his disciples, the seed the sower sows is God's word. Very clear, God's word. Well, for us, this is God's word, the whole thing. So we need to hear and understand God's word. And there's enough in it that a person my age who's now read through it, I don't know how many times, many times, I'm still learning things as I go through new truths and things I didn't know before are revealed in new ways. I'm sure if you're following Jesus a long time, read his word a lot, you've had similar things. Sometimes the word just lights up to you because your circumstance, your situation. This is God's word. And it's truth. God's word is the truth. Truth is how it really is, regardless of what you think, regardless of what I think, it's how it really is. And this is how it really is, regardless of the world's viewpoints, regardless of worldviews that are different from this, this is the truth of God, and we can rely on it. It's an anchor for our soul. Now let's talk about the different soils that, he, that Jesus talks about. The first, he says, are the people along the path. I promised myself I'd stop taking these things off and on. I watched it on video, and it made me upset, upset with myself. But here I am doing it again, so please forgive me. I even printed my notes out in 16 points so I could read them without my glasses. The people along the path refers to those who hear God's word, but then the devil comes and takes away the word from them and their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved. So all of these soil types are people. They're people. And it's describing what happens. And the first ones are the ones he calls along the path. The, ski, the seed is sown, the path would be hard. It'd be in places that wouldn't likely easily take, you know, be able to get into the soil and bear fruit. But he says, these people who are like that, even though they hear the word, the devil quickly snatches it away from them. Why does he do that? So they won't believe and be saved. That's why he does it. What does that tell us? When you're talking about people getting into God's word, there's a spiritual battle going on. When you're dealing with God's word, Satan doesn't want you in there. Certainly doesn't want unbelievers in God's word. He's going to turn them off. So he does everything he can to steal it. He does that in a number of ways. Often just simple everyday kinds of things. Suppose someone's heard a clear proclamation, might even be in a church service and not saved. They hear a clear proclamation of the word of God and the Spirit's convicting them. 
and they go out thinking about that and somebody says, hey Joe, I'm glad to see you. What'd you think of the game last night? Immediately distracted. Good intentions, but distracted. That's why I often you'd call for people to come in response to an invitation so that doesn't happen. Well-meaning conversations. The enemy is at work. The enemy is at work. And this is a battle. And the truth of God's word is what the Holy Spirit uses to convict and to convince and to draw people to himself. And Satan does everything he can to keep them from it. I suspect as we go through these, we can all think of people who may fit the various categories. It's likely that if you're now a believer at one point, you were in one of these categories. Which should inform what you think about that question I asked about what's in Jesus' heart as he shares the parable. So, what are the, what's the second kind of person, the second soil? The second one is those on rocks. Well, see, he doesn't grow on rocks very well. These are people who, first they hear the word, they rejoice in it, they like it, but they have no root. They believe for a while, but in a time of testing, they fall away. Life is often hard. We know that. Life is not a bowl of cherries. Life is hard. The old saying, life is hard and then you die. Well, that's pretty pessimistic, but it's not completely untrue either. Life is difficult. It has testings and trials. And they come to good people. They come to the saved and the unsaved. Often, though, testings afterward can destroy the faith of someone who initially believes and receives with joy. Perhaps they're disappointed that God didn't do something exactly like they wanted him to do it. It's not a small matter. Many people have an unbiblical view of who God is. They don't fully get his sovereignty, that he's in charge of all. People tend to worship a God of their own making. It's said that Thomas Jefferson had a Bible and he cut out everything he didn't like. And he only read what he did like. Well, what he was left with wasn't God's word. It was a God of his own making. The God of the Bible is real and he's sovereign. And you have to deal with him as he is. And he's loving and he's kind and he's good. But he also allows hardships. This life is not our final home. That has to be kept in perspective. Many people fall on that point. The third type of soil is those, the seed that falls among the thorns. And Jesus says, they hear, but as they go their own way, they're choked by life's worries, riches, and pleasures. So they never mature into faithful followers of Jesus. It may be that this is the most subtle and common problem. It's probably true always, but it's certainly true in the day in which we live. People are very busy, very busy. Try to find a way to get in somebody's schedule. Family responsibilities, jobs, school functions, sports activities, other har hobbies, cabins up north, friends to see, fun to have, any one of a thousand things that people can do, and those can squeeze out the time and leave virtually nothing for God. In and of themselves, none of those things are bad, are they? They all have their place. But life's busyness can choke out God. This, these three types of soil ultimately are talking about people who don't come to faith and are not saved. That's primarily what these three types are talking about. However, a couple of additional thoughts. 
First of all, before we were saved, we probably fit into one of those. So it's not hopeless for people who are in those places. Secondly, even though we know the Lord and are walking with him, these parables and these types of soul can be applied to us as Christians. I'm going to get to more of that toward the end of the lesson. I want to make it clear so there's no misunderstanding. I'm certainly not saying that people who are genuinely saved can be lost. I don't believe that. I believe that people who are genuinely saved will persist and they'll be in heaven. We believe that. But there's a sense still in which these parables can apply to us as believers. And I hope you'll think about that. Because our lives, too, can be so busy, so full of activities, sometimes very good things, that what gets crowded out is time for God. Matthew 6.33, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. That was my dad's life verse. Back when cards were sent and letters before social media and email and texting and all the rest, we actually sent things back and forth through the mails to each other. Whenever dad would send a letter or a card to me or any of my siblings, at the bottom it would say Matthew 6.33. It was his life verse. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All the other things will come as they should. The other things basically are the necessities of life in the context of Matthew. We as believers are challenged by that. We could develop hard hearts if you're not careful. We could allow disappointments in God to rob us of our joy and peace in the Lord. We can allow the busyness of life to steal some of our priority sequence where the Lord's not really on top of that. So I just challenge you to think about those things carefully as you ponder your own heart. There is in Hebrews and in Corinthians two serious warnings it applies, the first one, ultimately to unbelievers, the second one to believers. In Hebrews 6, 4 to 6, we read these words. It is impossible, impossible, for those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the coming age, if they fall away, to be brought back to repentance because to their loss, they're crucifying the Son of God all over again and subjecting him to public disgrace. There's been much talk about this verse over the years. Some would say they were Christians because of these words. They've been enlightened. They tasted the gift. They've shared the Holy Spirit. I think it's really not talking about people who are genuinely saved, but about then those who have been exposed and then turn away. And this says it's impossible to be renewed under repentance. That's a dangerous place to be. And then in 1 Corinthians, there's, there's a caution to believers. It says this. If you think you are standing, be careful you don't fall. There can be an arrogance. There can be a complacency in the life of a Christian that thinks, I'm all good, I'm, I've got it made, and everything's okay. And you become so complacent in that that you fail to pay attention as you should to your daily walk with the Lord. It's wise not to feel for your salvation, but it's wise to take continuing note of your own spiritual life. I'm not talking about taking your temperature every day to see if you're saved or see what your temperature is. I'm talking about allowing your walk with God to be pr so primary in your life that you're paying attention to it all the time. You're monitoring your own heart. You're monitoring your own mind. That's what I'm talking about. I expect, as we come to the last type of soil, that most of you here are 
one of those. Jesus said, lastly, the seed went to those on good soil. These are people with noble and good hearts. They hear the word, they retain it, and by persevering, produce a good crop. In Luke's account, he says a hundredfold. In Matthew and Mark's account, they have a little more detail on they It says 30-fold, 60-fold, or 100-fold. In other words, there's various degrees of crops. But everyone produces a crop. In other words, there's fruitfulness out of a life where the seed is fallen, there's good. And as I said, I suspect the vast majority of you here today are among those who've received the word or walking with the Lord, and there's fruit coming from your lives. Could there be more fruit, perhaps? So pay attention to your spiritual life. It's always important to tend to the soil of our own hearts. Remain tender-hearted. Don't get don't, don't allow yourself to be hard. Allow the word of God to penetrate your heart and soul. Be quick to hear it and obey it. Always ready to repent and follow closely. In other words, allow God to continue his good work in you. In this way, you guard against finding yourself as one of the unproductive soils Jesus talks about in this parable. After sharing that, he went on to say this at the end of the chapter. Let me read it to you. No one lights a lamp and hides it in a jar or puts it under a bed. Instead, he puts it on a stand so that those who come in can see the light. For there's nothing hidden that will not be disclosed. And there's nothing sealed that will not be known or brought out in the open. Therefore, consider carefully how you listen. Whoever has will be given more. Whoever does not have, even what he thinks he has, will be taken from him. So after telling this parable, Jesus then uses this metaphor of, of course, in his day, a lamp was an electric light bulb. It's probably a lit candle. Says you don't put a candle, don't put a bushel over a candle. You don't hide your light. You let it shine. Otherwise, it's worthless. He says the light is going to shine so much that there's nothing going to be hidden, concealed. What's he talking about? Well, he told them, listen carefully. Clearly, he's talking about his own teaching. Remember, Jesus is the light of the world. And he brought us the light of the world. He is the light. What he teaches is the light. And that light, when it's proclaimed, because the work of the Spirit will penetrate the dividing of soul and marrow, the dividing of your conscience, of your unexamined motives for things, the word of God penetrates deeply. When you allow yourself to be open to it, God will work on you. He's not punishing you. He's in the process of making you more like Jesus, which is what he's all about for believers. Allow his word to penetrate. That's what he's supposed to do. So he's talking about his own proclamation of the world, but he's also talking about the disciples, and by extension to all of us, we are to share God's word. Uh, a couple weeks ago when Jordan and Eddie and I were at the conference in Cleveland, the basic conference at Alistair Begg's church, I think it was number 24. There's been 24 of these. It was great. But we, we uh, discovered a new evangelism tool that's been developed that I think is really, it's so, it's so uh, non-contrary to your, what you think. It's right along with what you think. It's a tool that actually uses God's word to get to people and to bring conviction and light. Instead of just our words, it uses God's word. We're going we're gonna to show you more of that, hopefully in the weeks and months to come, how we might use that very tool. God's word will reveal. Nothing will be hidden. There, there's coming a day of judgment, as you know. 
when every secret will be revealed, except the ones you've repented of and the blood is covered. I don't think you'll be shamed for us who know him and walk with him. But for those who reject, there will be no secrets. It will all be revealed. The function of God's word is, is a big deal. Knowing God's word is a big deal. And we need to pay attention to it. So in Jesus' final words about being a light spreader, I think that's how I've characterized that last section. Don't hide your light, be a light spreader. That's what we're to be. Truth that is not shared, that last verse will be taken. Truth is not shared and understood by definition will be lost. If you don't share it, how's, how's anybody going to know it's going to be lost? You have to share the truth. The truth that is shared will produce fruit. I think this is a challenge to us as followers of Jesus. And Pastor Ken was big on this. He would say, get better at learning how to share the truth of God's word. Get better at it. It's like any other skill. You can get better at it. And we're going to show you one tool that can help you do that pretty easily down the road. Don't just sit idly by and watch your good friends and neighbors go willy-nilly on their way to a Christless eternity. Take God's word seriously. Share it with them. You can't bull them over. You can't knock them down. You wish you could believe for them, and you can't. But you can be better, smarter, wiser in how you share God's word with them. And there's a call to share the light. It's our job to be light spreaders. So I come back now to the two questions I asked at the beginning about why did Jesus share this parable? What's in his heart when he tells it? The Bible doesn't tell us this in this passage, but we can discern it from the context of everything we know about God and about Jesus. Why does this book exist? Luke 17.10 Lord came to seek and to save those who are lost. That's why this is written, to give a full account to seek and to save. What is in Jesus' heart? Well, he's telling how it really is. This is how the word is received. It's received some on rock along the way, some on rock, some on thorns, and those don't believe. But everybody's there at some point, and the seed has to get in, so we should share it. That's the big picture here. Share the news. Take God's word seriously. But Jesus wasn't sharing this in some condemnatory, angry, harsh way. I don't believe at all. What is Jesus' heart? Jesus' heart is, come unto me, all you who are labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. His heart is yearning. His heart is loving. His heart is full of compassion. He's not against you. He's for you. If you don't know him, if you're a sinner and you haven't yet believed in him, God wants you to come to him. He loves you. And if you come to him, you'll experience what you've never experienced in your life. Joy, peace, contentment beyond what you believe. That's his heart. Jesus' heart is full of compassion. Those of us who know him love it. What about our hearts? That's the second question. Well, I've kind of said it already in the context of the mission of the minister, this message. We need to tend to the soil of our own heart. We need to be people who love other people, who are full of compassion. We're not anxious to condemn. Yes, there's all kind of strife in the world, but that's not our job. Jesus said he didn't come in the world to condemn the world. He came in the world to save it. Those who don't believe are already condemned. You don't have to condemn them. They're already condemned. You have to show them the light. Let's have hearts that love other people, even the most unlovely, even the most unlovable. This started out by ladies from whom Jesus had cast out demons. Do you think they were attractive when they were being run by demons? A lot of the people we encounter who are most needy are unattractive, 
not just physically, but in their being. It's our job to share the gospel, the good news with people in a loving, compassionate way. So let's watch our own hearts. I finish with this verse from Proverbs 23. Above all else, guard your heart. For it is the wellspring of your life. Lord, I pray that your word will do its work in us, that by your spirit you will help us to live for you, to follow you, to share your love with other people in a way that's kind and compassionate and caring, not in a way that's condemning and harsh and difficult. 